Towns and smaller cities across Ontario already faced affordable housing difficulties. Then came the influx of people during the pandemic, pushing prices way up and supply down. With us now on the urgent need for solutions, and as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Petawawa, Ontario, with Lisa Lance. She's a rental agent and owner of Relocation by Lisa. In Westport, in eastern Ontario, Robin Jones. She's the mayor of the village of Westport and president of Roma, the Rural Ontario Municipal Association. In Godrich, Ontario, Wayne Caldwell, professor of rural planning and development at the University of Guelph. And in Roncesvalles, in the provincial capital, Matthew Mendelssohn, visiting professor and founder of First Policy Response at Ryerson University. Great to welcome you all to our program tonight here on TVO. Let's dive right in. And Lisa, first of all, a special welcome to you. Your first time on television, and we're happy that you're doing it with us here on TVO. But you wear many hats where you are in your neck of the province. And I want to start by just asking about your job as a rental agent there. What does it involve? Well, the rental agents kind of something I fell onto. Um, I help mainly military when they're being posted in. We're coming uh, from a military town. I also help uh, CNL, the executives coming in, um, finding rental properties. And in general, anyone that's really looking. Um, the reason I started becoming a rental agent was uh, because of the shortage. People were having problems. So it just made sense for me to help. Gotcha. How's business right now? Uh, it's crazy. I've been doing this for about 12 years and from pretty much the start, it's been um, it's been busy and it just keeps getting busier and busier. And, uh, and especially since COVID, I, I can't keep up. It, well, let me ask a crazy question. Isn't that good for you? It is, but it's fine when you have the properties to work with. But when you have all these people looking and you don't have the inventory, it's frustrating for everyone. It's hard for me to do what I need to do. So give us an example here. Rents used to be what and now can fetch what? Well, first off, it's always been an issue to have inventory. And that's, like I said, the reason why I kind of got into it. Um, so the COVID's made it that much harder. But because the rents, you know, even... 2018, the average apartment would be, you know, $800. That same apartment since COVID, I'm now renting anywhere from 1100 to 1300 You know, townhouses went from 1500 to 2300 So it's a huge jump, you know, especially for our small community. Get it. Yep, I totally get it. Mayor Jones, you're in Westport, Ontario. So what's the real estate market like in your neck of the woods? Well, I'd, I'd agree with that. In my neck of the woods, there is almost virtually no rental available. Um, and this is a, a uh, seasonal, so the old, very old Victorian town. It's uh, seasonal from May 2 forward to Thanksgiving. And in order, we've got lots of jobs because we've got lots of stores, lots of businesses. But without having rental income, rental property available, uh, we have to look for a variety of ways so that the people who are working here during the tourism season have a place to live. What happens in many rural communities is, is it's a trifecta. Uh, Westport, say, has the jobs, but no rental accommodation. So the people have to look at the closest community um, to the village where there is rental accommodation and they can find some no transportation between that community and this. So this imp is such an impact to our economic stability um, that uh, it's part of the paper that Roma launched yesterday at the conference. Which we will get into in a second. But uh, again, you know, we are used to hearing about this story happening in the big cities. It's now happening well beyond the big cities of the province. Why do you think it's happening right now? Well, in specific to rental, um, a lot of the rental in rural areas were in large homes that had been converted into three or four apartments. And with the people coming from uh, urban areas, and you know, let me say, we welcome them, we're thrilled that they want to be part of our community. But what it means is they buy those larger homes, convert them back to single family dwelling, and the three or four families that were in there uh, prior to that are now left without rental accommodation. It, it's, it's a challenge on, on many levels. Um, people coming in from the farm, uh, seniors who, you know, farmers, people who are seniors, they want to, uh, their church, their community is in the closest village. But when they sell the farm in the farmhouse, there's no place for them to go. So we've heard from Petawawa, we've heard from Westport. Let's go to Godrich, Ontario now. Wayne, what's the situation where you are? 
Probably a similar story, I would think. We have uh, lots of demand, a limited supply, uh, and in addition to that, uh, prices continue to escalate. A uh, function of COVID, of course, a function of retirements, and a function, of course, of the nature of work, more and more people working from home. And uh, the result, I think, is people have been caught unawares uh, with uh, COVID as it's uh, uh, occurred. And uh, the result is uh, significantly higher prices and limited supply. How much of this was a problem before the pandemic hit? Yeah, I think it's something that we were noticing before the pandemic hit. It certainly got much worse with the pandemic, but I think, uh, you know, again, uh, the movement to rural Ontario was occurring in advance of that. Certainly the retirement sector was starting to occur, putting increased pressure on housing. But if we look, for example, in, in Huron County as an example, uh, the average price of houses has more than doubled in the last three years from somewhere in that neighbourhood of 250000 to more than 600000 And for folks in particular that may have limited income, uh, that's a real issue, a real concern for them. 600000 for a home in Huron County? That's right, yeah. That yeah. is astonishing. Okay, it, let's go to incredible. the guy in the big city who's been watching this issue for some time and who has written a report about this. Matthew, I just want to start by, by, I mean, you've spent most of your career, obviously, in the big cities of this country. How surprised were you to hear about this happening in rural Ontario? Well, it's not particularly surprising. We haven't been building enough housing, enough affordable housing for a long period of time. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear that compared to other prosperous countries, other G7 countries, uh, our supply has not been keeping up. Uh, it has yes, as you say, been uh, an issue first in some of the larger cities. Um, but uh, as we've heard, communities don't exist in isolation. Um, communities exist in kind of complex regional ecosystems. And the relationship between uh, communities uh, and housing supply uh, matters. And so if housing isn't affordable in Ottawa, people move out of Ottawa or Toronto and they move to mid-sized cities or they move to suburbs. And, you know, the relationship between uh, Strathroy or Glencoe is related to housing affordability in London. So um, to the extent that we haven't building enough supply anywhere and people want affordable places to live, um, it's it's not particularly surprising that this, this problem is going to affect uh, all communities. Well, let me do the follow-up about the paper that you wrote, and um, it's, uh, I guess, about a 40-page paper with some ideas in there about what inclusive growth ought to look like in these parts of the province. And why don't we just start off by getting a definition of what you mean when you say inclusive growth? What are you talking about? So uh, we did a paper with uh, Canada 2020 on new approaches to uh, regional economic development in rural Canada, in smaller communities in Canada. And when about uh, inclusive growth, um, what we are talking about is a change in mindset from looking at just economic growth is GDP going up to whether or not communities are healthy, sustainable, inclusive, whether there is housing, whether there is internet connectivity, whether there are public services, whether there are local sustainable businesses uh, that um, you know, provide services and benefits and products to uh, people in those communities. So more and more people are looking at ways to measure the health of a community based on, you know, are we building community wealth? Are uh, people healthy? Do people have access to good schools and health care? So all of these things are, are how we focus on economic development right now. And that's that's kind of a different model from can we find one signature investment or one big industry that comes in here and uh, creates some jobs. It's about the whole you know regional community ecosystem. Are people benefiting from that growth? Okay, and uh, let's get some views. As you pointed out, many different ways of measuring now what inclusive growth means. Uh, Mayor Jones, let me get back to you on this. How how would those definitions apply to the housing situation in your community? Well, um, <laughs> not very well, uh, particularly if I could speak for the province as, as the chair of, of Roma. Uh, the uh, uh, challenges that we have in, in rural Ontario for housing um, are, are re somewhat constrained by the fact that most places are not on on sewer and, and water. They're on, on, on wells and septic. This is, so that, that's one challenge. Um, the, uh, the 
cost of housing, going back to Wayne's comment, the cost of housing going so high, we're paying urban prices in rural Ontario that the local people can't, can't afford them. I, I don't know if I answered your question, Steve. I was distracted by the discussion on how we measure economic development, and we've included much of what was just said in our paper. So and let me answer it that way. Outstanding comments, because we think in 2022, there needs to be other criteria than just um, GDP. So w well done. We uh, are, are on the same page there. Gotcha. No, that that you answered it uh, straight ahead. And let me let me follow up with Wayne on that. Then um, these high prices for homes and high prices for rents. What kind of ramifications do those things have in smaller communities in this province? Yeah, I think. I mean, one of the things that it's done is it's pushed up the high the price of existing housing significantly. And historically, it was always more it was more costly to build a new house than to buy an existing house. And now those existing homes. Are are in a comparable price point as as building something new. The result is it makes it much more difficult for folks, as I mentioned earlier, on limited wages, uh, to be able to afford something in today's market. And I just think that that causes issues for families, it causes issues for communities, it causes issues for services, and so on. Uh, but there is a positive I think that's embedded in that, and that is in fact the construction of new housing, because all of a sudden with those inflated prices, I think it'll become more attractive to developers to in fact build. And historically. The market often wasn't there in rural Ontario for folks to invest significantly in new housing development. So I see there's a positive underlying it, notwithstanding the higher prices. Well, Lisa, didn't you and your husband, in fact, do that? Yeah, that's absolutely what we're doing and still doing. We're um, developing properties um, for rentals, making rental investments, because, of course, we can see the need and what is, is our community needs for rentals. Um, so we built townhouses. We built um, a big 39-unit um, apartment building. Um, we did have the seniors in mind, but to be quite honest, we were flooded with everyone, you know, military, the CNL, um, looking for accommodations. So um, we do plan on building other apartments. But, you know, getting through the red tape to get things built is really tough. Um, you know, which Who's would... red tape? Are you talking municipal or provincial red tape? Um, our town, our town itself, um, just doing the bylaws, what we have to have, um, the land, you know, making sure um, we, we're, we're fitting all the requirements. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's tough. We have the investors that want to do it. It's just being able to build it and being able to support the rents once we build it. And once you've got it built, how tough is it to rent it out? It's not. It's not at all. Um, the only problem is the rents back again. They have to um, compensate for how much it costs to build things nowadays. Hmm. Mayor Jones, I heard some story about a farmer who, who rented out his fields in your neck of the woods. What's the story there? Uh, th th that's the idea of them. People come in from rural, uh, their, their, their place is in the village or the local community. And uh, when they no longer can sustain themselves, or as in this example, uh, rented out the farm, the farmland, uh, he, he was out, the family was out of luck. They couldn't stay in the community where they had lived their, their whole lives, where their friends were, where their families and their church were. And, and, and I think you'll find that particularly rural mayors, we take this personal. Because we know these people, they're, they're our neighbors. Um, the the mayor in a small rural mm -hmm. community is the first person who gets a phone call about whatever, not related, perhaps to municipal issues. So we we really feel for these people when there's an exodus of seniors out of small rural communities to the urban centers because we can't provide them with rental accommodation. Hmm. Matthew, I wonder if you could pick up on Lisa's story from this standpoint. It is pretty clear, as I'm hearing from everybody that we need more housing stock in this province, all over the place. And yet, from what she's saying, from what Lisa's saying, there still seems to be still too much red tape at City Hall, which gets in the way of making that happen. What's the bigger story there? Well, th there are lots of big stories, and th there's a diversity of communities and a diversity of different kinds of needs. We've talked about seniors' um, accommodations, uh, accommodation for uh, young families. But I mean, the one big story is a good news story, which is people want to live in Ontario. 
Ontario is going to continue to grow. It is going to continue to attract people. And because of better connectivity, digital, but also rail, there is the possibility for people and businesses to make all kinds of choices about where they want to live and how they want to live. And rural communities in Ontario, smaller cities in Ontario are all really attractive places to live if you can get a, a, a number policy pieces, right? The digital connectivity, um, uh, the transportation networks, and certainly uh, the housing. And so to me, uh, I think we've reached a point where all governments, municipal, provincial, federal, are recognizing that uh, zoning uh, uh, decisions, administrative decisions, how long it takes uh, to build things, um, access to capital, all of these things have to move along much, much uh, more quickly with a key strategic focus on supply, on building a diversity, uh, affordable renting, new home ownership, co-op models, all of these things. One thing to remember is the housing market uh, is not a free market. It is heavily, heavily regulated. Uh, how you get a mortgage from the federal government, provincial regulations, municipal uh, zoning and hearing rules. So all of these things are, uh, uh, are, are defined by policy and our policies have not been good enough to get the supply we need. Well, that takes me to Wayne next. Uh, okay, we've mm -hmm. heard all of the good reasons why people might want to invest and live in rural Ontario and how things are improving when it comes to broadband, uh, but it still sounds like supply is a bit of a problem. So uh, what do we do to unlock the, um, the dynamism of the economy and get more stuff built? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And just to say how much I agree with the advantages of a, of a degree of growth in rural Ontario, because we have many communities that have been losing population. So to try to make this happen, I think, is in everyone's uh, collective interest. And I think you know, there's a variety of things I think that we can look towards doing. Certainly increased density has been mentioned, uh, both uh, in terms of perhaps mixing low and medium density housing together so that we have pre-zoning, which is to say that if you've got an approval for a single family dwelling or a single dwelling, uh, you also have approval for townhouses and duplexes as part of that. We have second units showing up both in farm properties and elsewhere, and that's already good progress has occurred. Uh, the reference has been made to uh, red tape. I prefer to call it green tape because it is important that we, re we remember that those kinds of rules and regulations that often take time are there for a reason, whether it be public health with water and sewer as an example, or whether it be the standards we apply to housing. I think there's a whole variety of things that are there for purposes uh, that are reasonable. We just need to make sure that we uh, make the, the system more efficient and effective in terms of advancing things. So I think there's those kinds of things. There's turning to manufactured housing um, and making sure that, and again, this is one of the advantages of somewhat higher prices in terms of increasing profit margins and making it more attractive for folks to actually invest and build in rural Ontario because historically we didn't have the demand and therefore the construction wasn't happening. No, I appreciate you making the distinction between red tape and green tape. And I want to go to Mayor Jones on that because uh, green tape we need, right? We need you folks to keep regulations in place that ensure that we've got a healthy water supply and that kind of thing. But red tape, we know too many examples in big cities and little towns all across the province where red tape uh, deters construction because, uh, you'll forgive me, local politicians are sucking up to local residents who are already there and who are already voters and, and they don't want more density in their neighborhoods. What do you do about that? <laughs> so, uh, nimbyism, I heard another expression for it the other day, which was banana. I don't quite remember what all that was, but it was... Oh, it's something uh, like build, build anything. Yeah, what the heck is it? I forget that. Yeah, too, absolutely but... nothing anywhere, anytime or something like that. That's yeah. it. Good, Wayne. Yeah. That's it. Absolutely <laughs> nothing anywhere, anytime. Uh, you know, I think it's... Uh, the, the challenge is we're not nimble. So, uh, th there is certainly the issue of the nimbyism and the ability to um, make a, an appeal to LPAT and slows things down. And yesterday I was, well, better, I was better on- Better explain that acronym because uh, LPAT's oh, a new thing. Okay, um, Local Planning Authority Tribunal, I think is what it stands for. It's the um, body that if you disagree with development in your area and other things, but because we're talking about um, housing development, you, you can appeal. And developers will try very, very hard to avoid that because it can tie the development up for, well, for years. Is There's just far too many examples. So I think that that's when, when Wayne was talking a moment ago about 
uh, that the green tape and that we need um, that sort of re those regulations, but we need to be nimble. Uh, you know, that we're, we're getting e-permitting and we're, we're uh, starting to be able to put your um, application through building um, permits through electronically, which is good. In eastern and rural Ontario, you still need connectivity in order to do that, but I'll park that for a moment and still say that it is progress. But when the um, other things for development, whether it's um, the Conservation Authority has to approve the plans and uh, the um, Ministry of the Environment uh, and oh, I forget what their rest of their conservation authority or conservation they're called, you know, the they have to look at everything. There's some blocks there, some slowdowns that if there was a mandate that when the um, when the file hit the desk of the ministry, there was a certain number of days before it was turned around. That would be a big help. This is not pointing fingers. They're hardworking people in those ministries. But if there is not an expectation that they've got to be part of the process and speeding things along, then why would they? So I, I know in my municipality, with the development that we've got going here, we are I've made the commitment right from the get-go that when uh, we are know that there's something that needs to go to council, we will do what we can to adjust the dates we, uh, so that the that we're not we are not holding them up. But with some of the provincial entities, we need to do the same. Well, let's do some real life examples here, Lisa. When you were trying to get more housing stock built in Petawawa. How much of what you encountered would you have called green tape, legitimate, good regulations we want to see, and how much of it was red tape, which was just blocking what you wanted to do for no apparent sensible reason? Well, my husband's a better one to talk to about this, but I'd say that uh, it was it was just small things that we get kind of tied up. We're trying to be efficient. We need to get the, the project going. Um, it's not that the community wasn't trying to work with it. It's just everything was a process and every little bit took way longer than what we wanted to spend um, to get things going. Um, it's hard to keep people motivated just before you can even get in the ground, you're a couple of years into it. So it's just trying to, I don't know, make things happen a little bit faster, you know, and I totally respect that these things have to happen. Um, it's just being a little bit more efficient on it. You still sound a little frustrated by the whole thing. Well, it is what it is. I mean, we've been developing properties and whether we're building homes or, or uh, making subdivisions and it's, it's just the process. It's just how it is. For me, it's, I want things to come along so we can start getting that supply for people. So they're not so frustrated. And part of the reason why the rental prices went up so much, especially during COVID was obviously because we didn't have the supply. So I would put, um, you know, say I put an apartment on, uh, Kijiji or my website for say $900, you know, a reasonable, affordable property, I would get 30 applicants coming in and then the bidding war started. So even though you're mm. trying to keep, um, you know, things at a reasonable, you know, affordable level in, in renting, everybody just drove the prices up, you know? So the next thing you know, people were offering way more. And in my 12 years of being a rental agent, this just wasn't something I ever had to deal with. And all of a sudden, the average person couldn't even stand a chance to get that property because they were getting outbid. Gotcha. Wayne, let's do a real life example from your situation. You got a piece of property, I gather, uh, mm. in Godridge, and um, you built a second mm. place on it for your son. How did that go? We well, actually, uh, went. It's fantastic. I'm I'm in it right now. We uh, uh, we're on a farm actually, and uh, sold the farm to our daughter a number of years ago. And we built a garden suite on the farm, and uh, we've been here full time uh, with COVID uh, for the last couple of years, and we'll be full time here once I eventually retire. And it's it's fantastic. It's uh, on the small side, a touch over a thousand square feet, and uh, meets uh, our needs wonderfully. And what about the green tape versus the red tape? How much of that was involved? Um, there was there was some of that. Uh, we had to go through agreements with the municipality, but uh, I suppose I was fortunate in that I know the planning system and uh, understood the local bylaws and what they were uh, wanting to achieve. And uh, we worked with that. We have a shared driveway, shared water, shared uh, septic tank, uh, shared hydro, um, all of those things that uh, I think from a policy perspective are appropriate in terms of allowing a second unit on a farm. And as long as you stay on speaking terms with your kids, I guess it's all going to work out fine. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> okay, that, good luck that with that. 
Yeah, absolutely. But it's one of those weird things. You go through a process. Uh, we entered into a legal agreement as we were advised to, and it's always funny to do that with someone you love, but uh, it was the right thing to do because circumstances change over time. So it's good. Indeed. Okay, Matthew, you're the policy guy. Get in here. How do we, I mean, what what needs to happen to unlock more potential and get stuff built? Uh, so... Uh, it, it'll be frustrating that there's not one simple, easy answer. Uh, there's a diversity of solutions, but um, we have to be do, working on all uh, fronts simultaneously. This is a problem that has been decades in the making. Large cities felt it first, then some mid-sized cities and now rural communities are feeling it, but it, it it's not going to get fixed overnight. I mean, the people, uh, my colleagues here on the panel have been talking about very specific local situations and challenges that, again, we're not going to fix uh, tomorrow, but the federal government uh, has a role in terms of uh, you know, supporting um, uh, uh, or, or challenging questions around uh, foreign uh, buyers, around investment properties, around uh, house flipping. Um, there are rules that can change to make it easier to do co-op housing and to do co-op development with not-for-profits. The province right now has a task force that is looking at uh, likewise how to make lands available, how to streamline uh, the process. Cities can do inclusionary zoning and make sure that there are affordable uh, rental units available uh, when uh, doing um, new developments. Uh, we can eliminate some rules and regulations. So if you're converting a single family house to a duplex, or a triplex, uh, you can just do that. If you can build a second property on your house, uh, on your property, you can just do that with very, very minimal rather than lots of administrative processes. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different things that all governments have to be working on. And I'm, I mean, it's a bit that it's not gonna get solved overnight, but I'm optimistic that there seems to be a, a growing consensus um, across all governments and communities uh, that we need to make it easier uh, to build uh, uh, houses of all different kinds and uh, affordable houses of all different kinds um, and that governments are working on this. Well, okay, let me take that checklist and go over to Mayor Jones. I mean, some of the things that Matthew just mentioned uh, are obviously in federal and provincial jurisdiction and you can't do anything about those, but some of the things he mentioned are on, they're, they're in your sphere of influence, and I wonder how much political appetite there is to go ahead with some of those things. Increased density, allowing people to build second units uh, or convert to triplexes without having to go through a song and a dance. Do you know whether City Hall is open to that stuff? Yeah, I believe they are, um, the, particularly the secondary suites. <clears throat> Pardon me, um, uh, the new le actually the legislation was changed uh, by the province to allow municipalities to make those changes in 2019 and we're starting to see it roll out now so it might have been the push that the municipalities might have needed is the housing crisis that we're in but i'm not hearing resistance to any of the suggestions that he's made um, by uh, my colleagues across the province does that mean it's going to happen oh i think so uh, I, you know the the reality is we have to, first of all, look to see what we can do in, in municipalities, and those are some of the things. Um, the, the density issue doesn't really impact us as much in rural Ontario as, as it does in, in urban, but the um, secondary suites or the additional properties on farmlands uh, is something that is, is talked about. And as I say, in my um, own municipality, um, we have just uh, actually done two things. We've taken the um, provision or the uh, granting that the provinces has provided um, through social housing for the secondary suites. And we're also putting aside in our budget, uh, we hope to pass a, another stream of doing secondary suites. So I, I think it's, it's going to happen. Um, it's part of the way of finding a solution. And quite frankly, Steve, the public's demanding it. They, they need options. Okay. I, I, I see lots of people nodding their heads on that last <laughs> point that you made, uh, Your Worship. So I'm going to take that and run with it and thank all four of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Lisa Lance, Mayor Robin Jones, Wayne Caldwell, Matthew Mendelson. Great of all of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO this evening. Be well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.